Hey folks, how are you? It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back in Yellowstone. Let me begin by uh, thanking uh, Suzanne Lewis, the superintendent here at uh, Yellowstone. Thank you for the passport, Suzanne, to let us back in. The folks, uh, uh, and uh, I tell you what, um, does anybody doubt Ed's a third generation Montana? And I tell you, I don't doubt it a bit. Just look at him. And I told him I know MSU. I, I, I didn't get it mixed up. I, uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, John, thank you for the great job you're doing for the entire National Park Service. Look, it's a real, it's a real honor to be back here uh, uh, in this magnificent park. And I must tell you, um, the most exciting part of the day I'm looking forward to is uh, when we finish. And my granddaughter Naomi and I, we're heading out. We're spending the rest of the day in the park. Uh, and uh, you know, this is. Uh, this is a place where Americans, as you see them by the tens of thousands, uh, and many of you, I know you've forgotten more about this park uh, than we're going to ever learn, but uh, tens of thousands of Americans get to see uh, the real estate they own up close. It's part of their, it's part of their, pro I mean, you, you know, you, you folks are here all the time. I don't think you realize when, when folks of us from the South, the Midwest, the East, when we head here and we bring our kids here, and we come into the park, the kind of exhilaration we feel. I know it sounds old hat to you guys, but uh, because you see it every single day, but it literally is a feeling of exhilaration. I remember when I came in here with my sons early on saying, we own this, honey. Every American owns this. This is part of our history. It's going to be here forever. And so it really is part of our inheritance. And uh, it's, uh, it's what we're all going to leave, and you're allowing us to leave to our children and our grandchildren. Thank God for Ulysses S. Grant. I hope you Southerners aren't offended by that. But in, uh, in 1871, as, uh, as was pointed out by, uh, by John, he and the Congress decided instead of bidding all this away for putting it up for sale, which is this giant block, which is bigger than my state and bigger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined, uh, um, was going to go to the highest bidder. And it became America and the world's first national park. And coming from the little state of Delaware, the first state, we're especially proud and protective of America's firsts. And uh, this is, this is the granddaddy of all the parks. And I'm sure, uh, uh, as I said, I'm sure those of you who are with the Park Service and live here know all the details. But for average American, I don't think they realize, as I said, that this one park is bigger than Delaware and Rhode Island combined, almost as big as the state of Connecticut. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just kind of breathtaking for most Americans to know this. The naturalist and, and author John Muir said uh, of America's national parks, and I quote, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and to pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to the body and to the soul. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in these times, we're indeed blessed to have the park system we have that reveres, all of you revere what John Muir talked about, maintaining this beauty. This is sort of the national cathedral behind me here. My daughter and I, granddaughter and I, are heading from here to Grand Canyon. That literally is a cathedral. It is a cathedral. And uh, it restores and it inspires those who come to visit. And as we used to say when I was a senator, if you excuse a point of personal privilege, I hadn't planned on saying this, but um, one of the reasons I wanted my granddaughter Naomi with me. In 1972, I was elected to the United States Senate as a 29-year-old uh, kid. I wasn't old enough to be sworn in. I had to literally wait three weeks to be eligible to be a United States Senator under our Constitution. And in the meantime, uh, my uh, wife and daughter and uh, two sons were Christmas shopping and uh, were broadsided by a tractor trailer. And my wife was killed and my daughter was killed. And uh, my two sons, who were little boys, uh, Naomi's dad was my number two son, Hunter, they were hospitalized for a long time. And uh, back in those days, there used to be a program on TV for little kids. It was, uh, it was called Yogi Bear, and it was uh, Jellystone Park. And all my kids wanted to do was to go there someday. And, um, and so uh, 
I decided that in 1974, in the summer of 74, we, uh, the three of us, we flew into Salt Lake and we rented a camper and uh, we started up through Dinosaur National Park and came up here and spent a week. And I want to tell you that uh, John Muir was more right than he knew. Uh, this is, uh, gave nourishment to not body but also soul. It was literally an inspiring visit. It reconnected my kids in a way that that some of you have had similar experiences uh, might understand. But it was uh, it, it really uh, it restored a lot of uh, a lot of their sense of uh, of uh, the future and the idea. I can't even explain it, but it was real. It was real, and so that's why I wanted my granddaughter to uh, to see uh, this park in particular. For too long, our nation's crown jewels have been neglected. For years, led by a senator from Arkansas named Dale Bumpers, for the last 20 years, we tried very hard to get more funding for the parks. And it was always the last, uh, the last item on the agenda. The single greatest jewel we have was the last item on the agenda. And uh, so uh, we finally, this time around, when we decided that we needed to bring some stability back to the economy and begin to reinvest in this, in this country. I might add, by the way, if we were booming at 9% growth, if we had zero unemployment, everything we're doing in this park is worthwhile. It needed to be done anyway, whether the times were good or bad. We needed this to be done, and much more in my view. So what happened was this crown jewel that had been neglected for so long, uh, there were a number of critical upgrades that were needed. Repair jobs uh, that had been stalled and uh, kicked down the road year after year. And today, through uh, this effort spearheaded by the president, we're beginning to polish once again these national jewels, improving the parks without interfering with their natural beauty. And that's the important part to emphasize here. We're repairing without interfering. We're reducing, in many ways, the human footprint as we make this more available, more available to people, making these parks easier and better places to, vi to visit, and in this hard economic time, creating jobs in the process. We just visited a construction site across and down the road uh, where uh, the Madison Watershed Treatment Plant is being reconstructed, the old one being demolished and the new one being built. As you all know, but the public may not know, you know, it is very unglamorous to come to a magnificent park <laughs> with this background and talk about water treatment. But folks, it's all about being able to see this beauty without marring this beauty. It's all about being able to feel this, inhale it, smell it, feel it, taste it without marring it. Because we are humans, we leave behind a footprint. And so what's happened here is that the old facility was flooded, sending sewage into the Madison River when visits, uh, when the vistas were uh, marred by the site of the old facility, when odors wafted over the uh, campgrounds, uh, nature lovers couldn't really ignore it, and uh, nothing much was being done about it. But this new system is not just modernizing. The system was built back in the 50s. It is actually changing and bettering what will happen, reducing the nature of the footprint by creating much more efficient facilities, now being able to process up to 75,000 gallons of wastewater a day as opposed to the 30,000 gallons the old facility was in. This new facility will work in the winter as opposed to the summer, which is a big deal. You all know it's a big deal. That's the case. Most people wouldn't understand the significance of that, but it's real. With the majesty of the Yellowstone stretching out behind me, uh, most people don't really want to be talking about wastewater facilities. But it's all part of about how we're going to improve this park and all of our parks while making the facilities more efficient and, in a sense, less visible in every way. You know, it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, this facility. There's, this is just one of six Recovery Act facilities that are taking place right here in Yellowstone Park. And six out of 800 that John is overseeing throughout our entire national park system, from Acadia National Park up in Maine to the Grand Canyon in Arizona, the Everglades in Florida, Olympia National Park in Washington State, all parts of what we're calling the summer of recovery. 